So we had a couple of um, interesting topics, and I wanted to just uh, bring up the issue of central cord syndrome. So we have two um, power players here. And Ali, you're still here. Come up front, my man. So this is actually a real life case. Our fellows are kind of, one is totally pooped because we operated like mad the last couple of days. And I'm here, the fourth compadre. So come up front. This is actually a real recent case. Uh, 40, sorry, 70 year old Polynesian male. Oh yeah, wait, pull the chair over. <laughs> so this is a, a very large male, body mass is 49 uh, index. He fell on his face. Um, he does not speak English uh, really well. He's one from the small island systems. Uh, he has trace motor. He probably has a side differential because there's a strong suspicion he had a stroke as he fell, uh, either leading to the fall or whatever. He has sacral preservation. Uh, he has very poorly controlled IDDM. And he has no obvious fracture, but uh, you can see the soft tissue envelope on that CT scan reformed on the right, somewhat also on the MRI scan. There's a certain amount of undulance. We have no plain films. So there's a question of a stroke with a facial droop on one side, trace motor, low extremities are preserved distally, and um, there are no tricks here, there's no fracture. Bob, do you wanna venture for a stab as to, this is a disaster, this actually came in not too long ago at night, the usual evening so, <coughs> consult. You know, it's very interesting because he's he really tight you know, with that uh, that segment, I'm assuming that's probably the uh, the lower one. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of classic. The you fall on your face, and uh, then all of a sudden you can't uh, you can't ambulate. And then uh, has he made any uh, any differences? You, this is where he comes in. You don't have any earthly idea whether he got better or whether he got worse over 24 hours. Uh, so we had a we have a very aggressive stroke center, and he came here under the premise of a stroke. Okay. Uh, so this is why he came here. We're not a trauma center, but this is not an infrequent occurrence, as Amir knows. They're coming in under a stroke premise. And then the stroke neurologists go like, yeah, we want to anticoagulate him, but there's a small pons infarct. But it's not so bad, really. And then you're left with a patient who pretty clearly <clears throat> has probably dinged his cord. And the cord is too tight. To it's, show it's, it's, the, it's really tight there. I mean, you know, this is one of those guys that I would say, uh, you know, used to years ago, we would watch them and just see how things happened. And, and now I'm looking at this canal and that that cord is right in that, uh, you know, in that realm. We can look at this. It's probably what? 12, three 13 millimeters, millimeters or so. Three millimeters. So now you're going to be. Uh, we're sitting on a guy that potentially can die. So I'm going to go real aggressively here uh, and for sure take care of that uh, that level. And I'll probably just go anteriorly. Anteriorly? I would go anteriorly. Like what? I would uh, go anteriorly. So I am seeing C, uh, definitely C3 through C7 is between 4.5. I didn't measure it all out, but... Uh, there's an image somewhere where we measure those out, actually. Mitch sagittal diameter is between 4 and 2.8 millimeters. So C4 to C7. If you, go, if you go to this segment here, then I'm not as concerned with these others. I'll see what he does with this anterior. And then if I have any questions, if he starts getting better, then I may follow him a little bit. If there's any issue at all, then I'll go anteriorly with this one, and then I'll do something like a laminoplasty on the back. Okay. Ali, you're no, not immune to that. So we yeah. have a, a plea for a possibly aggressive surgery, but anteriorly, I'm still not sure where Bob wants to go. I mean, this. look at this right-hand image. So see wait, I have seen the move, so I can see this so clearly. This is for sure. I'm going anterior. Right. I'm going anterior right there. And then... You can, you can go three down to seven with the laminoplasty and open everything up. Yeah. What worries me is that you, know, you have all this calcified ligament behind the reticular bodies. And so I'm not convinced that I can do 
I mean, I could. You could do multi-level corpectomies and then put a strike graft and flip them over. I think the more efficient procedure for me would just do it posteriorly. And so in this case, I mean, you could do a laminoplasty, but I'd favor just doing a, a laminectomy infusion. So, so surgery, you'll just go, I mean, he's been there for 24 hours, a stroke service has looked at him, he's had a CTA, he's had two MRI scans in a short while, he has a small pons infarct on the left, so right-sided weakness, slight facial droop, but his uppers are kind of pretty out, lowers are there. Do you want to then just do the surgery pretty rapidly there? You're a neurosurgeon. Yeah, I, you can I, do it. You no. Know, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the problem is that they're going to want to anticoagulate them too, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, this is a pretty significant deficit. So I actually wouldn't sit on it. I would fix it. Fix it. And front? I like from the back. Like what? What levels? So, again, you know, I think that given that he has a stroke as well, I just want to get in and out fairly quickly. So it looks like two, three. So I'm assuming this is... The three, four? It's uh, three, it's uh, the three, stenosis four, four, five, five, six. becomes really ugly from C3, really ugly. C3 with cord signal change all the way down through C7. Impossible to tell what's old and new. This, this is just a squished yeah. cord. And again, he has uh, the snake eyes at the bottom. So this has been probably existing for a while. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know what's old, what's new. And again, the I'm sorry to throw a wrinkle in. It's actually a fact of life here. We have a lot of patients from other communities. And... There's little or no English, and uh, that particular island system uh, has a iPhone interpreter, not even on our hospital-based system, yeah. so we had to use our iPhones for interpretation. It doesn't yeah. work that well. Yeah, I'd actually go C3 to C7. C3 to C7. I mean, you know the case, but what are your thoughts? So independent of what we did, this is my case. <laughs> so there are three pretty aggressive surgeons here. <laughs> so, I want to revisit that with Dr. Ramey. I, I mean, I, I think that when we're talking about central cord, um, you know, you could evaluate it as if it's a, a mild cord injury and, you know, time is, is function. Um, I think that's a very reasonable way to approach this type of injury. Um, so I agree with being pretty aggressive here. Um, the OPLL um, would push me away from doing a laminoplasty. I might do a fusion um, and... Again, that's mostly because I, I do believe in the teaching that um, the OPLL can progress with motion, so we should probably fuse them. Okay, Wyatt, you're the voice of wisdom now. So there are two to your left who want to go aggressive. Uh, Dr. Mezewala kind of changed tunes. Initially, he was all smitten with Dr. Uh, McGuire's anterior forays, but now he's kind of gone C3 to C7. Amir, I'm not totally sure what he wanted to say or do there, because he wants to have his robot working. He's kind of peeved that his robot's not uh, operational. No, I'm just kidding. So what are we doing? Do we, uh, you're a neurosurgeon. Do we run in that night? Are we the hero? And look at that soft tissue. Yeah, I'm, I'm not doing it that night, but I'm probably doing it the next morning. Um, in terms of how I want to, how aggressive I want to be with my decompression, you know, and we published on this together. Central cord syndrome. It's not. Um, a uniform diagnosis. It's on a spectrum. So somebody can, can come in with central cord syndrome completely motor intact with just burning in their hands, or they can come in with paralyzed hands, uh, but lower extremities functioning relatively well. So you have to you grade it out and let that guide uh, your, your decompression strategy. With, with a guy like this, with severe stenosis, not much movement in his upper extremities, I would tend to be more aggressive. 49 BMI is going to be a bear decompressing in the back. It's just one of those things you're going to have to suck it up and do it. Um, so I would do posterior C3 to C7 decompression fusion. Why stop at C3? Why not that the cord fall up or get a better mechanical fixation at C3? Because of the size. Size? I, yeah. Yeah. I, just, I, don't, I don't want to be putting in C2 pedicle screws with a guy BMI 49. He's got the posterior neck fold sign on MRI, and that just... You yeah, know. his shoulder girdle was at C2 level, just so you know. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I believe elaborate. it. I believe it. Now, the sore other subject, steroids. So, poorly controlled diabetes. Our infection control people, no. we have an under 1% infection rate. We're very proud of that. But our uh, problem here is that um, when we have an A1C patient that we have an infection on, and that was uh, in the high sixes or so, we already get chastised. So this guy's off the charts, actually, something like nine or 10. 
Steroids? Do we give steroids? No, I, I reserve steroids for young, healthy patients. No, no yeah. steroids. No steroids, Ali. No steroids. I mean, no steroids. Okay. And and a lot of times I don't I don't prescribe steroids because I don't want to be the one to to manage it and follow yeah. the 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 glucose and everything. It's just kind of a a mess. I'm here. And are we talking about a few doses of steroids? Like, are we talking, talking about, about full-on NASCIS, NASCIS 2? 30 milligrams per kilogram bolus, 5.4 milligrams per kilogram for a 23-hour strip. Yeah, I, I think um, some low-dose steroids would may help him, but I, w- I would not do the NASCIS, I think. Low-dose steroids, I'm looking at facetious here. In a BMI 49 patient, Again, what's, what's low-dose there? Like Anything's said, low you know, dose. Six milligrams, you know, or uh, you know, yeah. Q6 or Q4, you yeah. know, for a few days. You know, again, that's probably spitting in the wind. But uh, you know, I, I, the full the full bore nascus in a diabetic obese patient. Um, I think you're probably inviting some extra complication. So the fellow is not here, but uh, we can call him up. It's Colin Gold. He did this with me. He's operated a lot this week. Um, he could testify to the numbers. So we took him to the OR the next day. We did not do it that night, and uh, we did a C2 to T2, and uh, blood loss was honestly 300 cc's. The total time, including pre-flip baselines, was about four hours, and that's including one hour setup time. And uh, I could not believe, so I'm still not sure what's going on. This is uh, what I wanted to talk about here also, not just timing, but the guy, I expect him to be in the ICU, and they flipped him around afterwards, and they said, his vital signs are pretty good, and he's actually doing quite well. And, um, yeah, we'll send him up. Uh, we'll actually, uh, then a couple of hours later, I said, we'll extubate him. He's actually doing fine. He does not need pressure support. Yes, we had elevated MAPS, 90. And the next day, he sat out of bed, and he started moving his hands. Not a joke. Um, so he's, uh, we're now looking for neuro rehab, but he's actually started walking in the hall. He has kind of floppy arms, but uh, he's actually walked. So he's, again, Polynesian. He's... Uh, Maori, they're very tough. Um, they're island warriors, and he has a warrior mentality. I wish I could understand him more, but I was actually surprised he didn't bleed that badly. Yes, we use TX8, very debatable under a stroke. I would like to hear your thoughts on that from a stroke perspective, but our thinking was he has a terrible stenosis. This is not going to go away. There's always going to be this iffy thing. Our neurologists want him to be anticoagulated. We, based on our own paper, after 24 hours, anticoagulate. Usually goes well. And levels, I wanted to have that whole subaxial spine decompressed as maximally as possible. It was actually quite gratifying, and I was pleased how fast that went. And again, had a great fellow with Colin there, but um, I don't know. Why Overkill? Why, why did you rule that out? So OPLL, and this is a 70-year-old guy. You're going anteriorly to take care of that situation first. Um, no. You're OPLL, <laughs> I don't like OPLL You're and not. anterior. OPLL and anterior, and he has OPLL. I can show you the whole CT sequence, uh, but I don't like, I'm, I don't want to be a hero and I don't like to go anteriorly with what I perceive to be OPL. I'm with uh, Ali there. This is not a straightforward thing. That dural sac is usually a membrane. I think the only thing that made me even thinking about, think about going anterior was how bad his neurologic function was. Yeah. Um, if his hands were out, his arms were out, then I might have done a, a, back, a front back. Now, that when, when I looked at his neck from the front and from the back, I did not see where there was an advantage one way or the other. <laughs> uh, I would have had to have some laparotomy tools for the front approach. And um, so, uh, but you know what's actually really helpful? This is silly, but it's really true. Is get some metaphor tape and staple it to the yeah, to their ox. We actually do it. Pull it up to the yeah. Jackson table. This, it works this great. Is, this is a taping job. The oh, positioning yeah. is the first challenge to make sure they don't have respiratory pressures that are through the roof. And the second thing is a advanced taping job so that everything is completely smooth. Absolutely so. Stapled uh, tape to the occiput, multiple shoulder tapes and uh, scapular tapes to get the skin folds out with a lot of benzoin and more staples. I mean, uh, and he didn't bat an eyelash about that. They usually get asked about, what's all this stuff here? And so it's like, yeah. No silver taping. I'm here yeah. crazy. Am I crazy? I mean, he, honestly, you can ask everybody. You can ask our, our PA. They're, they couldn't believe how this guy just bounced back. And I'm not taking credit for it. Um, but why? One big thing about spinal cord injuries uh, is uh, spinal cord injuries is, you mentioned it before, central cords should have been eliminated from all those NASCA studies and all those famous yeah, cord injury studies. Yeah. And in retrospect, that's a huge confounder. If in one group you have seven central cords injuries 
and the other one you have three, changes everything. Right. Yeah. No, central cord shouldn't be included in the spinal cord injury trials. It's its own separate entity, and it behaves drastically different. Heck yes. I gave him full NASCAR 2 steroids. <laughs> um, he had really bad signals. Uh, we still monitored him. He had some lowers. So he had nothing in his upper extremities, but we gave him full-blown uh, uh, high maps uh, during exposure, very high maps during decompression. Um, and I gave him full NASCAR too. It went for it. I mean, he's not, he's still in house here, but uh, he can still get infected on me. But um, I told the anesthesiologists, uh, do your metabolic magic. And um, yeah. they did. I mean, in, in theory, the steroids should work, right? But the data for it is so weak, um, it, whether it's spinal cord injury or central cord syndrome. Um, and in a high risk patient, I just, I, I don't want to, I don't want to mess with it. With Michael Felix and AO, we did. Um, a very large prospective study that cost a lot of money uh, that was abandoned after a while, the real is all trial. But one of the many things that we looked at was the variables that surround spinal cord injury patients. And there, you mentioned that about the possible combinations of Asia criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual variables for spinal cord injuries are 2 million something. So you'd need to have a study that has a population of about 20,000 or so to actually try to start pilfering through the data. Right. Yeah, a lot of sentient data gathering there. So that was the thing. Uh, how's our lab doing? Is our lab getting ready? Otherwise, we'll do. You what? They're ready. They're ready. So hey, we'll. Do you remember that negotiation uh, discussion that we were having? We, that was a discussion that we had for that particular study, if you remember correctly. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, we'll switch to the lab, and then we'll have two final cases as the grand finale.